morning. Welcome to worship, everyone. I'm delighted to see you all here today, and a special welcome to all the Honschulds who are here, uh, especially those weighing down the uh, uh, choir loft up there. It's good to see that many people up there crammed together. Uh, I don't have any special announcements, and so we'll just begin our worship service today with the ringing of the bell and our opening hymn. Praise all you people, the name so holy of him who does such wondrous things that has been to praise him solely with happy heart it's amen sings children of god with angel host praise father son and holy ghost alleluia alleluia O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ. Alleluia. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship Him. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hand formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship Him. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. 
I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Testament reading for the seventh, or sorry, for the fifteenth Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter thirty-five. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert and burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. The epistle reading is from James chapter 2. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly... And the poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the, the whole law but fails in one point has be, become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel, which is according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. From there Jesus arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. 
Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the little children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened. His tongue was released. And he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. O Lord, have mercy on us. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Please be seated and I invite the children forward for the children's message. How are you, Brantley? Can you read for me today? Yes. Okay. No, you can't? You don't want to? What up, dude? Yeah? Okay. Well, good morning, guys. How are we doing today? Good. It is so wonderful to see so many kids up here for our children's message today. <laughs> well, one less isn't going to hurt anything. She can still hear me. Today, we're going to continue or we're going to start talking about this book again. Now, this book, that's pretty small, isn't it? I bet you got books at home bigger than that. But this book is really small, but it has a really long name. Does anyone remember the name of this book? Ardrew? Right, it's the Catechism. And good job, Clara, you said that too. Yeah, this is the Catechism. And this little book tells us everything we need to know about being a disciple of Jesus. And you guys are Jesus' disciples. You guys love Jesus, don't you? And you want to follow Jesus and do the things that make him happy, right? Yeah, so this is the book that tells you everything you need to know about being a disciple. And we're going to start with the Ten Commandments. And we lost another one. We're going to start with the Ten Commandments. I guess I better wrap it up soon. Uh, the, and the Ten Commandments tell us what God wants us to do. So today we're going to talk about commandment number one. And I want you to repeat after me. This is what it is. You shall have, you shall have no, other no other gods. Good job. Can you read that for me? Other than what does that mean, Brantley? What does this mean? You should fear 
love and trust in God above all things. That's right. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Fantastic work. Yeah, and our God is so wonderful. We are right to love him. Our God gives us everything. He takes care of us. He gives us our moms and our dads, our grandparents, our brothers and sisters to help take care of us. And he gives us our food that we eat, our fun times that we have, our clothes that we wear. He gives us everything. Any need that we have, our God promises that he's going to take care of us. And he took care of the most important need of all. He sent Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, I want you to follow me. And that's what you're doing right now. And Jesus is leading us to a wonderful, wonderful day in the future. Someday soon, Jesus is going to come back and we're going to see him and we're going to live in a world where there's no bad things and we're happy all the time. And Jesus is going to give you that, that future day because of his death on the cross and resurrection. That's how much God loves us. And he loves us so much that he even promises to be with us every single day. So even if you get mad and frustrated and you're having a really sad day or you're really frightened and lonely, God's there with you. And he wants to help you. So we can ask him and pray to him. And that's a lot. He does so many amazing things for us. So let's praise him and let's thank him right now. Okay? And that's commandment number one. Before we pray, we want to say it again. Okay? Repeat after me. You shall have, you shall have no, other no other gods. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for taking care of me. Help me to trust you always. We love you. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming up, guys. My brothers and sisters in Christ, he's right down here. He's working his way slowly there. <laughs> no one's going to be able to hear me until he gets up, so. Judging from the kids, I think we all need to take a nap after worship. Well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, how you doing? You know that because you're at church, the answer is fine, right? But I don't know if you know this. I just found this out. When, when someone tells you that they're fine, when you ask them how they're doing, they're actually using an acronym, right? Where each of the, each of the letters stands in for a word. So when someone tells you they're fine, what they're actually meaning is that they're frustrated, insecure, neurotic, and exhausted, right? So that's, that's a whole lot. That's opening up a can of worms whenever you ask someone how they're doing and they say fine. So it might be better not to actually ask that question, but simply say, hey, it's good to see you here today. But that question still remains, right? It's that polite question that you're supposed to ask people how they're doing, and they're supposed to politely respond, I'm doing fine. That is, uh, unless you're like, remember, if you remember Lowell Pugh, whenever I would ask him that question, he would always say, well, you got an hour. But still, when you get asked that question, every, I don't know a single person who wouldn't want to answer 
honestly and truly, I am doing fine. I am doing great and wonderful. I am good today. Yet what do we mean when we say that we're doing good? Are we talking about our emotional state? Are we talking about, when we say we're doing good, that we've got enough money in the bank account? Or maybe that we're just generally having an all right day that day? You see, with, if we don't know, how can we actually say that we're doing fine and mean it? Well, St. James, in our reading for today, actually gives us a, a metric, if you will, that we can use to answer that question, how are you doing? This is what he says. If then you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. You're doing good. So that's how we as disciples of Jesus Christ can know that we're doing good. That is if we're fulfilling the royal law, a love your neighbor as yourself. So you see, it's not about how much money we have or how emotionally well we're doing or if we're not in any conflict. We can say that we're doing well, that we're doing good if we're loving our neighbor as ourselves. But yet, we got to know, how do we love ourselves? Right? We've got to stop and think about that for a moment. And here's the thing. Normally when we talk about loving our neighbor as ourselves, we usually think it's got to mean something like like. Like we've got to like everybody and get along with everybody and, and just feel warm, fuzzy feelings for everybody. But I don't know about you, but that's certainly not how I love myself. There's lots of times I don't like myself very much. I don't like the things that I've done. But yet, I still love myself regardless. The great Christian writer C.S. Lewis really helps me in, my, in clarify my thinking of how is it that we're supposed to love, love our neighbors specifically as ourselves. And he is, writes it so succinctly and clearly that I just want to read to you his answer. He says, You are told to love your neighbor as yourself. How do you love yourself? When I look into my own mind, I find that I do not love myself by thinking myself a dear old chap or have affectionate feelings. I do not think that I love myself because I am good, but just because I am myself and quite apart from my character. I might detest something which I have done. Nevertheless, I do not cease to love myself. In other words, that definite distinction that Christians make between hating the sin and loving the sinner is one that you have been making in your own case since you were born. Love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. So loving your neighbor as yourself isn't about liking people, but it's about seeking after their ultimate good as far as you can do it. And loving other people in that way is how we can know that we are doing good. But right away our Lutheran training sort of flies in here and we all know that, well, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. I can think to 18 times this last week when I haven't loved my neighbor as Myself. Even this very morning, this morning, I was short with my children when they were pouting about what clothes to wear to church. So there, I haven't loved my neighbor as myself. And James says, in addition to that, that if you break, that he says, whoever keeps the whole law but transgresses in just one part is guilty of the entire thing. So that means, because I got a little short with my children this morning, I'm guilty of the whole law. And therefore, I can never say at all, in any honesty, that I'm doing fine, that I'm doing good. Now, I'd certainly agree with that logic up to a certain point. But after that, it sort of becomes an excuse for not having to do anything. Each one of us does need to recognize that we are lawbreakers and that we do sin against other people 
And we are guilty of transgressing what God would not have us do. But the thing is, that's not the end of, your, end of the story or your story. Love your neighbor as yourself. St. James calls this the royal law. And it's the royal law because it's the law that the king himself has kept. Jesus Christ loved his neighbor as himself. He loved you as himself. He sought after your ultimate good. And he didn't do it in the words of C.S. Lewis because you were a, a good old chap. No, he loved you even despite the fact because of your twisted nature, you believed that he was your enemy. He loved you anyway. And he laid down his life for your life. He went through death and the grave, through cross and torture so that you might have life, an everlasting life. He shed his blood to, so that you might be forgiven of those places that you have tra transgressed the law, even in those li little parts. So that if you are forgiven from the, for those little parts, you are forgiven of breaking the entire law of every single sin that you've ever committed. That's what Jesus went through. He loved you in that way. And he went through that so that through his death and resurrection, joined to him, you might have an inheritance, a kingdom. That's the kingdom of God. And it is yours today. And that kingdom of God is the promised land, a perfect world where there is no violence, there is no poor, there is no rich, there is no need. In that world, there are no earthquakes, there's no hurricanes, there's no wars, there's no mental illness, there's no heartache, there's no death. Right? Come, Lord Jesus, let us have that inheritance today. You know, when we have such an awesome Lord who's given us such a great inheritance and a great future to look forward to, when we have a Lord who's loved us like that, how could we not strive to be as good of disciples as we possibly could? How, I mean, even if we can't be perfect, how could we not strive to do the best we could? We, we should never let the, the perfect ever be the enemy of the good. And we can most certainly be good by loving our neighbor as ourselves as best as we're able. We should try to seek their good, everyone's good, so that we can answer truthfully to that question. That question that if someone asks you, how are you doing? You can answer, I'm doing good. Now, there's lots of different ways to love your neighbor as yourself. Lots of different ways. You can just count of all the needs that you have, like food, clothing, work, and so forth, and apply that to other people. But there's one particular way that St. James identifies in our reading for today, and it's what I want to focus on. And it's that we love our neighbor as ourselves when we do not show partiality. Now James identifies showing partiality of the rich for the rich over against the poor. As if the, if the rich were the people that we needed to pay attention to and were important and mattered and the poor people were of no account and we can just get rid of them because they're good for nothing. That, of course, is bad and we shouldn't do that. But partiality actually comes in all sorts of different shapes and forms. And just this last week, as I was actually preparing for a sermon on partiality, in a conversation that I had with someone... They laid an accusation against our church that we show partiality. And not in terms of money, but in terms of your last name. The accusation was that unless you had the right last name, then you were of no importance in our church. And that you didn't matter. And that no one cared. 
and that you weren't going to receive help. The accusation that was, unless your name was this, you were less than nothing to the people of Emmanuel. Now, when I first heard that, I of course, I don't think I showed it, but I got really defensive in my heart. I thought to myself, you can't say that about my church. That's not true at all. But then as I kind of calmed down a little bit and got back to the office, I stopped and I just kind of thought about it for a while and pondered on it. I was wondering if it is true because as a wise man recently told me this last week, where there's smoke, there's usually fire to a certain extent. So are we guilty of showing partiality based on whose people's family names are? Honestly, I don't see it. But that doesn't mean we're by any means acquitted of that. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that we're not, a, we're not guilty of it. Because, you know, and again, to use a great C.S. Lewis line, our own sins can be an awful lot like body odor. Right? People see ours and recognize ours a whole lot more than we do our own. So are we guilty of showing that partiality? Again, I don't know, but I think we should take in that accusation, we should take it as a golden opportunity to examine our own lives and be on guard against all types of partiality. We should root that out and make sure that if it's ever there, that we get rid of it as fast as we can. You see, someone else pointed out to me as I was talking to them about partiality is that they thought Emmanuel wasn't necessarily guilty of that, but what Emmanuel is is a very tight-knit congregation that is full of a lot of families. And these, the members of Emmanuel are very faithful and loyal to each other and are ready and willing to help each other out. And I think that is a fantastic thing. I really do. But... Maybe that's where that, you know, accusation or that perception of partiality comes from. I don't know. So since we help each other out and since we're so loyal and good to each other, let's keep that going. And let's keep going further. Let's show that same kindness and love that we show to our fellow members to all people. Let's make it obvious that regardless of your last name, that the people of Emmanuel will show you and treat you with dignity and respect. And regardless of how long your family has been in Lockwood, the people of Emmanuel will seek your good. That's not necessarily going to take that accusation away but that will give us something to continue to work on. And James makes this very clear. It's not optional. He says it right away that showing partiality cannot be held along with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord of glory. And the reason why you can't do that is because of who he is and what he has done and the fact that he has shown no partiality at all in his love. But he loved all humanity by seeking humanity's greatest good because he laid his life down for every single person regardless of who they are. Even for sinful little you. Amen. And now we'll sing the Te Deum. Please rise. Prayers today, we will especially be praying for uh, Jessica Brewer, one of, her, one of our members. Her uncle Ralph Brewer passed away uh, due to complications with COVID. And her uh, aunt, aunt Anna is uh, slowly recovering from COVID. And we'll also give God thanks and praise for Dale and Charlene Lacey as they just celebrated on Thursday their 60th wedding anniversary. So that is amazing. The, when we get to the additional petitions, each petition will end in the phrase, through Jesus Christ our Lord. You are invited to respond with, Amen. 
I invite you to rise for prayer and we sing the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. We pray. O oh Lord, let your merciful ears be open to the prayers of your humble servants and grant that what they ask may be in accord with your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, be a source of strength and hope for the children in our families. When they stray, protect them from all danger and grant them your abiding presence. Guide them by your word in paths of wisdom and righteousness and send your holy angels to watch over them that the evil one may have no power over them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Father of mercies, God of all comfort, our only help in time of need, look with favor upon your servant Anna. Assure her of your mercy. Deliver her from the temptations of the evil one and give her patience and comfort in her illness. If it please you, restore her to health, or give her the grace to accept this tribulation with courage and hope. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, giver of life, we thank you for the mercies that you granted to Ralph during his earthly life, especially for calling him to faith in Jesus. Comfort those survivors who mourn his death, especially Jessica, with the hope of the glorious resurrection. Keep us all mindful that we are mortal so that we will ever be prepared to die in the faith and finally receive the glory promised to all who trust in your beloved Son. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, merciful Father, sustain and comfort all your servants who struggle with mental illness. Do not allow the evil one to trouble them but provide them with people who in wisdom and sympathy will minister to them in their need. Strengthen them and their families in the knowledge of your redeeming love so that they may ever look to you for rescue and help. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings of married life. And on this day, we rejoice with Dale and Charlene as they observe their 60th wedding anniversary. We praise and thank you for seeing them through their years. Bless them as you have in the past, in the years to come, that they might remain faithful to you and ever devoted to each other. By your presence, gladden every day that you graciously grant them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.